Thank you, Daniel. So I have to start with an apology, of course. Um, so our job as, a, as pen testers, we, of course, test systems for security issues. And we especially, we especially focus on voice over IP and with WebRTC security testing. So of course, we have a great interest in security issues, security vulnerabilities that are specific to RTC, not just you know, web applications and so on, like many uh, penetration testers, but very interested in what's being said here from a security point of view. So the question that often comes up when we're doing our work is how, how can, uh, what can someone do to remove the real time part from RTC? which means I'm going to be talking about the denial of service attacks. What I'm not going to be talking about, and this is not about volumetric DOS attacks, I'm not going to be talking about distributed DDoS attacks. Whenever you mention denial of service, people think DDoS. That's not what we're essentially talking about here. Um, what they are thinking about is saturating the bandwidth. We are more interested in the RTC system, in vulnerabilities that bring down the RTC system, not the pipe in front of it, not the bandwidth, uh, saturating the bandwidth in front of the RTC system. With that said, this is about denial of service, vulnerabilities affecting RTC systems. Um, we try to go through the work that we've done in the past years and try to find try to categorize the different attacks that we found under denial of service or not, and try to categorize those denial of service vulnerabilities that we found. Of course, we had to rem remove any identifying information. We don't want to disclose any, uh, anything that uh, might be considered confidential from our clients. So everything is very much distilled. We found the common denominators, and we're trying to describe them, these vulnerabilities, in more detail. So on the agenda, we had signaling, denial of, of service on signaling and media, um, monitoring tools, denial of service on monitoring tools, on security protection. And then we talk a bit about evading protection and what can be done to address the issues that we describe. However, um, my talk would have taken over an hour, um, probably an hour and 15 minutes, I think, um, if I hadn't removed a number of things. So I had to skip a lot of things to fit it into this slot that we have today, unfortunately. Um, I had to skip um, attacks on signaling. We had some great demos on uh, showing uh, uh, register flood on Camellio, register flood on, on asterisk PJSIP and ChenSIP. Um, we had some slides about proprietary WebRTC, a proprietary WebRTC protocol, um, which would the software would crash based on our malformed messages and how we did that. Um, we, we would have revisited again RTP bleed, the attack that we described two years ago, um, as from a, from a point of view of denial of service, an attack involving in, invalid the TLS uh, client certificate hello messages that hang up all the calls on a WebRTC system that we tested. Of course, this is fixed. Um, TCP and TLS flooding, which is quite essential in my opinion, had to be removed. TLS certificate flooding had to be removed. We had to remove a lot. So um, we were looking at packet capturing, uh, monitoring systems. Um, and of course, we did not include anything which is related to memory corruption, which leads to crashes or code-specific vulnerabilities, or even uh, attacks on callbacks, which are all interesting, and we can discuss all of these, but after the talk or during some break, if you are interested in any of these things. 
we also have a disclaimer slide. Um, you're going to be seeing demos of our lab environment where we tried to replicate what we've seen at client uh, environments or on the software that we've tested, on, on proprietary software that we've tested. So yes, definitely you're not going to see any clustering, load balancing, things that are usually in place um, and might handle denial of service better, but our demos that we're going to show do show what we've seen uh, with our clients, even when they had perhaps load balancing and so on. Um, so we're trying to replicate what's, what's in real pen tests. Of course, in our demos, we also had a lot of concern when it comes to bandwidth, because as I said before, we did not want to show problems with bandwidth, but rather with the software. So we controlled for this by making use of tools like iPerf and of course Ping and uh, so on to make sure that the problem is not a bandwidth problem, it's just the software or the setup um, that has problems. And very importantly, yes, I'm going to be showing Asterisk and Camellio and other software. The vulnerabilities that we show are not necessarily um, a problem in the software itself, but rather in the setup, okay? So you can definitely use the same software in a better way. So to keep on, when it comes to demos, we have a, a target machine, which has specs that are OK, I think, uh, eight vCPUs on, on uh, DigitalOcean, um, and 30, 32 gigs of RAM. On the other hand, the attacker machine is very, very basic, um, just half a gig of RAM, just one vCPU. So we kept it very minimal. And sometimes in the previous, in the uh, register flood demos, we spread out the attacks, but in the demos that you're going to so, uh, see now, they are just from one machine. Um, so that you, full disclosure, we did make some changes. Um, uh, the asterisk um, uh, PJSIP configuration has the threat pool increased, um, and Camelio has eight children. So let's start with looking at monitoring tools. Um, when it comes to recording systems, they don't appear to be the most obvious of targets for denial of service attacks. But what we found out was that um, if an attacker can start a call, and it's, there's a lot of cases where attackers can start a call, and they handle the RTP, then the attacker can send large amounts of RTP and cause trouble with the recording system. So let's take a look at our setup. Uh, my beautiful diagram here. Um, you've got the internet, which is one of the most important things on Earth. And then you've got the target that we set up. And uh, an attacker, just one attacker. And we have Zoiper behind our router and Lint phone, just to be able to make phone calls um, to test with. Sorry? And the ghost that I used as a rubber scrubber uh, to remove. So let's put this on full screen. Hopefully it works. Yep. So our demo, first we SSH to the target server. And we check if Asterisk is running. Asterisk is running. Then we're going to run VoIP monitor um, within screen. So we run VoIP monitor. Next, we're going to um, cd to this pool directory and monitor this pool directory where the recordings are created, where PCAPs are, where, where um, SIP dumps are created. So we're just going to watch that every two seconds. I had to invert the colors so that you can actually see something. Sorry about that. 
I am sorry, but so that's not a valid extension. You can see that Please the call is going through, is, is happening, and the uh, recordings are happening in the directory, um, small file sizes. So next up, we SSH to the attacker's machine to replicate the attack. And we're going to create a text file, payload.txt, with just 512 bytes of ACE. And then run our SIPVicious tool with the RTP flood uh, attack. We specify the address of the SIP uh, server, the asterisk server, um, where VoIP monitor is listening um, by sniffing, I suppose. Um, and then we specify who to call and the payload file, which we had just created. And this means that the tool will make this call and start sending the payload as an RTP uh, in its RTP stream. So we pick up the call. Now you could possibly here, tick, 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 that's the AAA. I'm going to stop the call, and one could start noticing um, once the uh, watch refreshes, start noticing the change in the file size of the audio directory. 1.4 gigs. Um, it keeps increasing. Um, I think there's some buffering going on and maybe some WAV files being created. Keeps increasing. And after I stopped the video that you're watching, it kept increasing up to almost five gigs, okay? In just a few seconds. There's no, no speeding up of the video or anything like that. So you can imagine what can happen in that case. So another thing that we've seen was um, there, we had a client who configured the firewall to log all dropped packets. They ran something like this on their servers. Um, and we realized that by just doing a, a port scan or just doing a cat dev view random and piping it to netcat on the target, the system would just go crazy. Um, the CPU was high, very high, uh, and the, the disk space was, they ran out of disk space very quickly. So this is, of course, something of a, quite a problem there. So next, it's security protection. Um, I'm going to be talking about IP spoofing, which is something that Henning actually alluded to. Um, so if an IPS such as fail to ban, simply blocks any IP address that you that attacks it indiscriminately, then you probably have a problem. Why? Because attackers can, of course, spoof any source IP address um, if they have the right server. Um, so in this case, we see a SIP trunk uh, being spoofed. So we have a demo for this. Um, we have the SIP trunk. I thought it would be funny to put real trunks there, but <laughs> my drawing skills. Um, and we decided to do this, um, this demo in lab environment because we currently don't have such a server that is able to spoof. But I hear that with Bitcoin, you can buy such servers without egress filtering, essentially. Um, so in lab environment, it's very easy for uh, an attacker to spoof the, ad, to, uh, the source IP address to pretend that it's coming from the SIP trunk and send such a packet, such an attack packet, to the target. So we have a demo here showing exactly how to do this. So we're going to SSH into our uh, test machine this is the target. It's going to be running asterisk. 
asterisk is running already. So we connect to asterisk. We make a call to the test number. Um, the asterisk server is configured to, can you hear anything? Does the audio work? I guess not. Well, anyway, the call did go through. It's a test number. We're using Twilio as a, as a SIP trunk. Now, next, we use Scapy on the attacker machine. So this is a separate machine on the same network in this case. We specify the target, which is the IP address of the uh, asterisk server, where there is actually fail to ban running. We load up the SIP packet that is known <coughs> to, um, to trigger fail to ban. And we uh, pass an array spoofed uh, with the IP addresses of the SIP trunk. Um, since there's load, load balancing on DNS level, um, we had to do this. Um, we have to go through each IP and spoof each IP um, 100 times each. So next, we, um, we have the payload. We produce the payload. We try to produce a, an incremental uh, ID so that um, asterisk doesn't ignore our messages. And then we use the send command in scapey with the source IP address uh, spoofing uh, the packets each time. So there's like 300 spoofed packets, 100 from each IP. Um, now, when one tries to make a call after such an attack, you can see, you cannot hear it somehow, uh, audio is not working, but uh, you can see the asterisk saying, cannot uh, create outgoing session to endpoint Twilio in this case. Um, and so no one can make any calls, outgoing calls, if they need to. I'm going to check out uh, fail to ban client to just show um, down there. I'm not sure if it can be seen from. OK. Uh, and all the IPs got banned um, by just triggering fail to ban. So another thing that we noticed is that during the attack, some systems, they generate so many logs. And if an IPS, like fail to ban relies on monitoring those logs, that might be a problem. The IPS needs to keep up with those logs. So you're going to have possibly a real attack happening during that time. So we have a setup a demo for this uh, with a setup of two attackers, or same attacker, but you know, two machines, uh, two source IP addresses, and a target. Also going to be targeting fail to ban, since that's one of the most commonly used IPS systems. So first we log <coughs> into our system on the internet this time. And we're going to run an HTOP just to monitor the things, uh, monitor what's happening. Asterisk is not running this time, so we have to start it. You can see that there's some internet, uh, some scanning already going on by someone, someone else. Uh, always comes on my live, uh, on my demos from where, when there's a system on the internet. We start fail to ban. Uh, yeah, this is the, uh, this is not, not us, okay? This is not part of the demo. And then we can try to do a SIP enumeration attack using SIP vicious SIP enumerate. And you can see that no results are returned 
because fail to ban is actually working, right? It's, it's actually stopping the attack. And therefore, the IP address of the attacker machine, test three over there, uh, did get uh, banned. So I have to remove it from, ban from being banned just to, to show the attack. Next, we log in to another test machine, test zero in this case, and we can run a SIP DOS flood, sending lots of options messages, um, just five connections on UDP, so it's not really connections, five sockets. And you can see that while this, att this other flood attack is going on, we can actually do the enumeration attack, and that works. Asterisk is, of course, the console is trying to keep up. Um, there's a lot of logs being written. Um, and if we switch to um, HTOP, we can see that, yes, there's asterisk uh, topping the CPU usage, but also fail to ban is really struggling big time in this case with uh, high CPU usage and, of course, missing real attacks. Of course, both are real attacks, so you have to... Um, yeah, you have to decide. So, evasion. Um, of course, <coughs> one can have rate limiting, um, but what we found out in our tests is that, yes, rate limiting does work, but um, there are ways around it, right? And the most obvious way around it is to find the right rate limit, to find out what the rate limit is, Stay right below it, and once you know that, you start more machines at the same rate. And start as many machines as need be until the system is overwhelmed. If you're a real attacker, that's a very plausible way to do this. Because many rate limiting systems rely on the source IP. Um, so how do we fix this? Well, rate limits, of course. Um, rate limiting is definitely useful. I'm not saying that, you know, I just picked on the rate limiting, but I'm not saying that rate limiting should be removed from your arsenal. I think it's really important to be able to train, to be able to find the right sweet spot. Um, and this requires a lot of testing. Um, and while testing, you have to keep in mind that distributed attacks do happen. Um, we've had, uh, you know, the invite uh, scan that you saw was distributed, actually. Um, we've, ha we've had, we've seen in the past years, uh, Celity botnet with thousands, if not millions, of, of machines, Windows machines, I think, were infected, and someone pushed subficious on them, and they started scanning internet hosts. Uh, so, yeah, this does happen. It's a very practical thing, so you need to keep it, keep that in mind. If you're thinking of doing over too much monitoring, don't. No one, no one really has the time to look through those logs, so it's it's a bad idea. Um, you you need to figure out what matters. Um, I did not go through fuzzing or memory-related issues, but I really recommend doing fuzzing. I really recommend uh, trying to compile your software packages with memory, memory sanitizers, like Asan, and so on. If they don't compile with them, something is probably wrong. So get th that fixed. Um, this can really make your software, once those issues are fixed, this can really make the software much more robust. Memory leaks, infinite loops, crashes, things like that they need to be addressed anyway. Of course, you could always buy more, but we know where this leads to. Um, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game. And of course, we do security testing, so I have to include such a slide. Um, but I also want to mention that I think it's really important that sec some security testing is done in-house. Tools are developed in-house so that Security tests are tailored to, the, uh, to, to your needs. Um, and it's very important that security testing internally is done 
over and over again. And if you need pen testing, then it should be done. It, it can be done as a very specialized thing uh, to maybe validate the results or find new things from the experts. So to conclude, we've seen flooding of the recording system with RTP, flooding of the firewall si logging system, um, subverting the IPS to block a SIP trunk, which can really uh, cause trouble there, um, flooding the IPS just to run another attack at the same time, some tips on evasions, and of course, some thoughts on solutions. I don't really have one solution. Um, I wish I did. I would be uh, in a much better position. But for each case, of course, there are ways to address these issues. Um, one idea that we've been discussing internally within our company is um, documenting these RTC-related attacks. Especially, we could start with denial of service, um, because for this presentation, we prepared a lot. Um, so we have a lot of content. Would that, do you think that would be useful? Um, let's, get discuss, uh, let's start discussing that, if you are interested. And would you contribute to, the, to something like a wiki, uh, which describes um, testing and vulnerabilities related to RTC? I would like to thank Daniel uh, and the Camaleo World, of course, team, um, and also Alfred, who's uh, prepared all the machines. He's done a lot of work. Uh, a lot of the code is, is his. Um, uh, yeah, it would have been impossible to do this presentation without his help. So do we have time for questions? Yeah, one, two questions. Okay. It's vicious. And we're taking. Uh, we will have a private beta soon. We've been working on, on the code quite a bit this year. Okay, so question, Andrew there on the next one, Henning. Hello. Um, given how easy it is to uh, spoof source IP addresses in UDP, things like reflection attacks and IPS, what, what, what do you feel is the best way to, to deal with that when you can't verify the origin of a, of a packet? I don't have an answer to that. It's it's an internet problem. Um, people are trying to solve it on all sorts of uh, other protocols as well. It's not solved yet. There's, there are projects uh, where they track who's allowing spoofing, and you know they still exist. Uh, 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 Repair or Ripe have a pro such a project. But, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Of course, using TCP, not UDP, but this is obvious. <laughs> that can help, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, I mean, that this helps help. a bit, yeah. Using TLS also, of course, helps, uh, makes at least more expensive for the attacker, makes all the, all the protocols more secure, also ZIP. Yeah. So I have a question. So you mentioned some, mm, yeah, Kamailu configuration, but I didn't saw any issues that you found for Kamailu. <laughs> <laughs> We, have, we had to skip this, okay. yeah. We did not find issues for Camaleo per se, but we did, as in, you know, if you do certain things, of course, you, of course. it's going gonna, it's gonna to prevent such attacks. But the default configuration, uh, we did test that. With invite flood, you get 100% CPU. With register flood and uh, MySQL database, I can show you the demo. No calls go through when that's happening. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, so Sandra will be here for the rest of the days.